assisting and preparing you to protect you and your colleagues during the current COVID-19 outbreak. I'm Professor Shea with Cape Cod Community College. COVID-19 is a flu-related virus. It acts like a flu, and unfortunately, the flu vaccine, as great as it is to get, and you should get it each year, is not going to protect you against COVID-19 because it's a new virus and we haven't developed a vaccine for it yet. It's best treated by resting at home, and the symptoms include fever, chills, sore throat, runny nose, cough, and body aches. If someone, whether it be your client, you, or a colleague presents with these symptoms, you do not want to interact with society. Utilize by ever means you can, whether it be video conferencing or the, using the phone or the internet to interact, but by distancing ourselves socially, we really can combat this virus and prevent it from spreading further. The quicker that we combat it and we prevent it from spreading, the less people that get it, the virus won't continue on. Now, once you no longer have these symptoms listed on this slide, you do not want to return to face interaction until these symptoms are completely gone. Now, if you self-quarantine, which is advised, if you think you've come in contact with someone that may be infected, whether it be the flu or COVID-19, you want to self-quarantine. You want to isolate yourself to your own residence, and you don't want to interact with others. You do not need to get tested for COVID-19 unless you have the symptoms listed here. You want to contact your local health department, and they will put you in touch with the state's health department, and then the state health department will authorize you to be tested accordingly if they think that it's warranted. If after testing you've been diagnosed with COVID-19, you cannot leave quarantine until you have been tested twice and receive negative tests both times. The two tests cannot be any closer than 24 hours apart. You can prevent the spread of this virus the same way you can prevent most germs from spreading. We just want to wash our hands with soap and water. Just use regular soap. And we want to wash our hands for at least 20 seconds. Using regular soap and warm water, we want to rub our hands together as much as we can and creates lots of bubbles. Soap is intended as a lubricant and the bubbles actually lift those germs off of your your skin so when you rinse your hands you wash the germs down the sink removing them from your hands which is great if you do not have soap and water available you may use a waterless hand sanitizer this is not a substitute for soap and water and if you do use a waterless hand sanitizer you want to wash your hands with soap and water when it does become available later in the day this will allow you to actually remove the germs from your skin as opposed to just putting it to sleep or killing it and leaving where it is which is what a hand sanitizer sanitizer does. Now, a hand sanitizer does have a very significant purpose in preventing the spread of germs and again is best reserved for when soap and water are not available, such as when you're in the car or certain workplaces. When washing our hands, we want to make sure we get between our fingers, the backs of our hands, and we also want to try to go up our wrists a little bit. It's also a good practice to clean the surfaces that we touch, especially horizontal surfaces like countertops, because these horizontal surfaces will actually collect anything in the air. And when they land, it lands on those surfaces like counters and floors that we often put things down on without the surfaces that we touch may include door handles or our books, maybe our desks, keyboards. These are all items you want to clean. Now keep in mind that electronics, you don't want to use heavy cleaners on them. They will be damaged. But a regular disinfectant spray and cloth is perfect. Again, the key is to remove these infective agents from your surfaces not necessarily to kill them and keep them where they are. If you or someone you interact with regularly is sick, you want to stay home. This is our best defense at combating the pandemic. If we isolate those that are sick or could potentially be sick, we can prevent the virus from spreading any further. Now again, you may not feel sick when you feel like you need to isolate. That's okay. This is a precautionary measure and you may not get sick, but by taking these precautions, if you are sick and you don't know it yet, you can prevent yourself 
from spreading that virus to others. And if you do become sick, we want to notify the proper people. In your case, many times is the local health department. And they will work with getting you the, to the proper resources to get tested so that we can find out what treatments are needed. To protect ourselves socially, as we advise social distancing, this means that we want to avoid crowds and lines. It's best to use any services that provide home delivery or pickup, where you can go to the grocery store and someone brings your picture groceries and brings them out to your car for you, or picking restaurants or grocery stores that utilize services where they deliver to your house. This prevents you from having to walk through a crowded store or stand in a crowded line on the way out. The same goes for restaurants. If a restaurant does delivery, that's best. Or if you can just go to the counter, pick something up, and leave, that's the best solution, preventing you from having to sit into a crowded restaurant. Or choose restaurants that have separated the seats so that seats are more than six feet apart, allowing people to have space and not contaminate each other. Buffets are high risk. So if you have a conference or if you're going out to eat, buffets unfortunately have everybody going into the same dish and contaminating the same food. By having individualized plate-based service, this eliminates that risk level. And last, it's a very hard habit to break, but Try to avoid touching your face with unwashed hands. That includes applying cosmetics and contacts, and this may include while eating. Try to use utensils as often as possible when able. But even if you just get that itch, again, make sure you wash your hands first. And if you have wa properly washed hands, you can scratch all you need. But with unwashed hands, again, very hard habit to break. But we want to avoid touching our eyes, our mouth, or our nose. The best way to prevent is to realize how it happens. So, the way we are going going to transmit infectious agents is primarily through direct contact. So this is not just going to include the oral cavity or chest cavity, but also what is on your equipment, the blinds, the countertops, walls. Everything gets spread quickly and unnoticed. Something that we primarily have to concern ourselves with, our direct contact, is of course our biggest concern. But the one thing we tend to forget is inhalation of airborne microorganisms. Microorganisms are floating throughout the room for quite a long time, actually, well after the procedure is even completed. So if we remove our mask and we re-enter the room, we're potentially breathing in stuff that we don't even know is in the air. So something we have to consider. A lot of times we don't realize that inhalation is also an unavoidable condition. We tend to aerosolize fluids within the body just by moving them and uh, spray, which breaks it down to much smaller molecules that can break down and become part of the air without us even realizing it. And this is a big factor to transmission of infectious agents, since it's unable to be seen and therefore goes unnoticed. You are going to inhale droplets that are aerosolized before they even have a chance to land on the surfaces. If we can visualize the way the infectious pathogens enter our body, we have a better chance of preventing an exposure. The best way to describe virulence is that if only a small drop of blood is needed to infect you, probability is probably not on your side. Compared to an agent like HIV, that takes a much larger blood sample to propose an issue. Now, of course, this is also dependent on the amount of body fluid you come in contact with, in comparison. I like to compare infectious agents to fish, substituting blood for water. A fish can be taken out of water for a short period of time, but depending on the temperature, humidity, and moistness of the surface you place it on, the fish will flop around and eventually die. Much in the same way, an infectious agent requires a small selection of substances in which you can survive and multiply and the substance that proves pathogens with the best source of nutrition and best environment in our blood and other bodily fluid. For the pathogen to travel from source to host, there needs to be a mode of transmission, whether that is blood on soaked gauze that you touch or splatter that has landed on something in your room. Now, of course, we, we can't actually get the infectious agent if there is no way for it to enter your body, which leads to a recurring point during this course of wearing gloves and other appropriate protective equipment. As far as portal of entries are concerned, 
We pinpoint any orifice of your body that is left open, as well as cuts or unhealed wounds. If you have any cuts, cover them up and make sure you wear clothing over it, such as gloves or sleeves of your gown. Our standardized approach to infection control includes covering our eyes, nose, and mouth, and this should be standard with every encounter. How many of you are up on your vaccinations? I'm hoping you all raised your hands for this one. Think of it this way. If you are not protected against the agent or your immune system is compromised, there is no protection if something were to enter your body. Vaccinations are like building a fortress around the village. Now the gate is still open and the knights can still scale the wall, but it will take a lot longer and it will weaken the enemy before they have a chance to fight. Using the same analogy, personal protective equipment is like shutting the gate and proper sanitization and cleaning relates to placing soldiers on the walls to kill off as many as we can. Taking into consideration that infectious agents are living things, just like a human needs food and a proper environment that can sustain life, so does an infectious agent. So if we can cut the food supply or we can provide an environment that doesn't sustain life for the infectious agent, or if we can reduce the numbers or inhibit the ability for the infectious agent to multiply multiply, we can prevent the infectious agent from carrying on. Maybe it stops in that host and that host does live, or maybe that host is the last or one of the last to carry the disease. So through vaccination, we can inhibit the reproduction. Through actually inhibiting the environment that we're in, we can inhibit its ability to reproduce. And by reducing its food or environment, we can prevent it from being able to travel from host to recipient. And road of entry may be the easiest for us to prevent, and that is through the use of personal protective equipment. Vaccinations usually play a role in the reproduction stage and temperature as well as counter services furnishings of the room that we're working in those all play a role in environment or in nutrition sharp instruments should never be placed where someone else can be at harm or you can harm yourself sharps containers that are puncture resistant should be utilized hand washing is fairly simple and we're gonna really cover this a lot so i won't cover it now but hand washing is one of our number one defenses and to be most successful at infection control we need to combine all of these items. One alone will never really protect us, but using them in combination provides us protection from all the different angles that we can encounter. Gloves are our first line of defense and should be worn for all encounters. As far as we're concerned, all sharps are potentially infective. The difference between an engineering control and a work practice control is that an engineering control is something designed to ensure your safety. So such as the foot pedals on a sink or the motion sensor that prevents you from having to touch the faucet with your contaminated hands. A work practice control is something that you do in the workplace that ensures your safety. This comes in the form of how you perform a procedure, such as where you place the syringe or scalpel immediately after using it. Do you put it in a sharps container or is there a secure place you keep it while you continue working? Work practice controls also include removing gloves when answering the phone. Washing your hands and arms is extremely important to both protecting yourself as well as preventing transmission of infectious agents to others. If your hands are visibly soiled, soap is the only option. A hand sanitizer is not going to remove the dirt and blood from your hands. However, if your skin is not soiled and you do not have access to water and soap source, then a hand sanitizer is a quick and convenient tool to use and keep in the vehicle and workplace. The key factor that we are presented with is the need to remove the infectious agent from our hands. Hand sanitizers only kill or put to sleep the majority of what is on your skin. Whereas soap acts as a lubricant and removes the infectious agent. You will never get everything off in either case and you don't have to. Just remember back to what we said about virulence. Before we soap up our hands, we want to turn on the water and rinse our hands, get all of the surface areas of our hands and wrists wet. This is what's going to allow the soap to activate and allow the bubbles to be created. Once our hands are nice and wet, we want to soap up our hands and we want to get 
all of the surfaces of our hands. We want to get between the fingers. We want to make sure we get the backs of our hands. We want to get partway up our wrists as well. Now we want to soap our hands up and rub them together for at least 20 seconds. The longer the better. The big part of this is to make sure that we get lots of bubbles. Those bubbles are again going to lift those items off of our skin out of the grooves of our hands and when we do rinse our hands that's going to allow the debris, those germs, that bacteria to rinse off easily without getting trapped in any of the cracks or the crevices uh, that we naturally have in our hands. Now when drying our hands the best way to dry your hands is to use a air-based blowing system, but if that's not available, you can really use any type of towel. Paper towels are great because we can dry our hands and then throw them away, leaving the germs behind that may be collected. But any type of towel. A hand towel is great. Uh, we do want to change them out frequently, especially during flu season or any time when there's somebody in the house that or the workplace that is sick because this will prevent us from passing those germs along to the next person. The other factor that comes into play is antimicrobial versus non-antimicrobial. Antimicrobial soap works in the same way as a hand sanitizer. It kills the bacteria on your skin. Now, in many cases, the general viewpoint would be that this is a good thing. Well, unfortunately, there is another factor involved. You see, this includes not just the bad bacteria. It kills the good bacteria, too. Your body relies on good bacteria to protect it and to function. The good bacteria destroy the bad bacteria naturally. This is also how your intestines work, with good bacteria breaking down food and protecting the lining of the intestine. So, without the good bacteria, the lining of the intestine gets eaten away. This explains why physicians have been cutting down in recent years on the amount of antibiotics that are prescribed. The second factor that works the same way is that if there's a mix of bacteria that can be killed by an antibiotic with a few that can't. Once you kill only the bacteria that can be killed off, you leave the resistant strains behind with no competition for nutrition, allowing them to multiply and transmit to others. Antimicrobial soap should be reserved and only in cases where you have been potentially exposed. In most cases, all you need is basic soap that will lubricate your skin and create lots of bubbles to lift contaminants out of the grooves. When doing laundry, the same concept applies. Bubbles are good and lift contaminants out of the weave of the fabric. It may be obvious that hands should be washed after bare hand touching inanimate objects that may be contaminated as well as soiled. The less common occurrence for hand washing that we do not want to forget is prior to putting gloves on as well as after taking gloves off. This may not sound as obvious, but to put it into context, you always have bacteria on your skin. Not that it's enough to hurt you or even harmful bacteria. The problem is we never officially know if the bacteria on our skin is harmful or not. So as a precaution, we wash our hands prior to placing gloves over them to reduce the amount of bacteria present. Gloves are impermeable surfaces, which will trap in moisture produced by sweat so having clean, dry hands will reduce the bacteria available to multiply in this perfect breeding ground during a long procedure. Of course, we will never remove everything, and bacteria will continue to grow. So it is important to wash our hands after removing gloves as well. This also ensures that if the gloves allowed anything in through the cuff, or if something degraded the ability for the glove to keep microscopic substances out, you're at least covered. When you use a soap dispenser, like the one in the picture, where does the soap come from within the bottle? If you said it comes from the bottom of the bottle, you're correct. But what is in the bottle is being pumped out. Shouldn't this create a vacuum crushing the bottle? The reason the bottle does not crush is because air is entering the bottle to replace the soap. This means the clear space at the top is now filled with air from your bathroom. Ew. Uh, kind of gross to think about, huh? Well, this is fine as long as we are always getting clean soap from the bottom, right? Well, tipping the bottle or shaking it up can place clean slope in contact with the contaminated walls of the bottle. Never thought about that before, huh? 
This is the reason that the soap dispensers in the public restrooms oftentimes contain bags inside. Part of this is for easy cleanup and change of the soap. Therefore, is no pouring involved. But from an infection control standpoint, this is a great feature. Soap comes out and the contaminated air does not replace it, hence why the bottle collapses. To ensure that the soap in your workplace stays sanitary, it is best to not refill bottles before they're completely empty. At that point, rinse them out and leave them upside down to air dry. Use a different soap container in the meanwhile. Once air dried, then it is safe to refill the soap and lotion containers. Washing our hands or using alcohol-based hand sanitizers can dry out our skin, leading to cracks. Any opening to the skin is an opening in the primary barrier our bodies have against infectious agents and other contaminants. It is important to prevent cracking of the skin by using hand lotions. The downside, however, is many lotions available on the retail market may smell great, and feel great, but they contain ingredients that can compromise the integrity of our gloves, placing us at risk without any evidence that the glove let the infectious agents in. For this reason, it is important to use lotions that are safe for use with medical grade gloves. The best thing to do is call or email the manufacturer of the gloves and reference the ingredients in the lotion to see if they are appropriate. If you purchase lotion that is designed for healthcare, you're covered. Another thing that can compromise the integrity of gloves is anything sharp that can puncture through. This includes long or sharp fingernails and jewelry. Artificial fingernails and jewelry with lots of crevices or spaces pose an additional issue. They can trap microorganisms in easily and release when working with food or interacting with your family or colleagues. Artificial nails have layers, unlike real nails. The layers are not visible to the naked eye and pose a hazard in trapping microorganisms. There was a case many years ago that involved a newborn baby dying due to microorganisms that were trapped in the artificial nails of a neonatal nurse. Now think if you brought home microorganisms to your family. Since this incident, artificial nails have been banned at most healthcare facilities across the country for all employees with patient contact, and in more recent years, that ban has been extended to administrators as well. PPE is required for any potential infectious disease exposure. The protection of personnel from infectious disease exposures in the workplace requires a combination of controls, one of which is the use of PPE. It is important to recognize that your protection also involves other prevention strategies. There are four major components to worker safety programs. First, our training. The administrative controls, like isolation policies and procedures, and procedures for recognizing patients with a communicable disease before they expose workers. Second, our engineering controls, like negative pressure rooms for patients with airborne diseases such as TB. And third, are work practice controls, such as not recapping needles, and finally personal protective equipment. While PPE is last in the hierarchy of prevention, it is very important for protecting professionals from disease transmission. All of the PPE listed here prevents contact with the infectious agent or bodily fluid that may contain the infectious agent. By creating a barrier between the worker and the infectious material, gloves protect the hands, gowns or aprons protect the skin, and or clothing. Masks and respirators protect the mouth and nose, goggles protect the eyes, and face shields protect the entire face. The respirator has been designed to also protect the respiratory tract from airborne transmission of infectious agents. We'll discuss this in a little bit more detail later. When you are selecting PPE, consider three key things. First is the type of anticipated exposure, such as touch, splashes, or sprays, or large volumes of blood or bodily fluids that might penetrate the clothing. PPE selection, in particular the combination of PPE, also is determined by the category of isolation precautions a patient is on. Second, a very much li like to the first, is the durability and appropriateness of the PPE for the task. This will affect, for example, whether a gown or apron is selected for PPE, or if a gown is selected, whether it needs to be fluid resistant, fluid proof, or neither. Third is fit. How many of you have seen someone trying to work in PPE that is too small or too large. PPE must fit the individual user, and it is up to the employer to ensure that all PPE are available in sizes appropriate for the workforce that must be protected. 
With this as background, let's now discuss how to select and use specific PPE. After that, we'll talk about which PPE is recommended for standard precautions and the various isolation precaution categories. Gloves are the most common type of PPE used. As you can see here, there are several things to consider when selecting the right glove for a specific purpose. Most procedures require the use of a single pair of non-sterile gloves made of either latex, nitrile, or vinyl. However, because of allergy concerns, some facilities have eliminated or limited latex products. Some gloves do not provide a snug fit on the hand, especially around the wrist, and therefore should not be used if extensive contact is likely. Gloves should fit the user's hand comfortably. They should not be too loose or too tight. They also should not tear or damage easily. Gloves are sometimes worn for several hours and need to stand up to the task. Who uses the other glove options? Well, sterile surgical gloves are worn by surgeons or other healthcare professionals who perform invasive patient procedures. During some surgical procedures, two pair of gloves may be worn. Environmental services personnel often wear reusable heavy-duty gloves made of latex or nitrile to work with caustic disinfectants when cleaning environmental services. However, they sometimes use patient care gloves as well. Gloves protect you against contact with infectious materials. However, once can contaminated, gloves can become a means for spreading infectious materials to yourself, others, or environmental services. Therefore, the way you use gloves can influence the risk of disease transmission to your workplace and home. These are the most important do's and don'ts of glove use. Work from clean to dirty. This is a basic principle of infection control. In this instance, it refers to touching clean body sites or surfaces before you touch dirty or heavily contaminated areas. Limit opportunities for touch contamination. Protect yourself, others, and environmental surfaces. How many times have you seen someone adjust their glasses, rub their nose, or touch their face with gloves that have been in contact with blood or potentially infected surfaces. This is one example of touch contamination that can potentially expose oneself to infectious agents. Think about environmental surfaces too, and avoid unnecessarily touching them with contaminated gloves. Surfaces such as light switches, doors, and cabinet knobs can become contaminated if touched by soiled gloves. Change gloves as needed. If gloves become torn or heavily soiled, an additional task must be performed. Then change the gloves before starting the next task. Always change gloves after each procedure and discard them in the nearest appropriate receptacle. Healthcare grade gloves should never be washed and used again. Washing gloves does not necessarily make them safe for reuse. It may not be possible to eliminate all microorganisms, and washing can make the gloves more prone to tearing and leaking. There are three factors that influence the selection of a gown or apron as PPE. First is the purpose of use. Isolation gowns are generally the preferred PPE for clothing, but aprons occasionally are used where limited contamination is anticipated. If contamination of the arms can be anticipated, a gown should be selected. Gowns should fully cover the torso, fit comfortably over the body, and have long sleeves that fit snugly at the wrist. Second are the material properties of the gown. Isolation gowns are made either of cotton or a spun synthetic material that dictate whether whether they can be laundered and reused or must be disposed. Cotton and spun synthetic isolation gowns vary in their degree of fluid resistance, another factor that must be considered in the selection of the garb. If fluid penetration is likely, a fluid-resistant gown should be used. The last factor concerns patient risks and whether a clean rather than sterile gown can be used. Clean gowns are generally used for isolation. Sterile gowns are only necessary for performing invasive procedures, not necessarily the protection needed within your workplace setting. A combination of PPE types is available to protect all or parts of the face from contact with potentially infectious material. The selection of facial PPE is determined by the isolation precautions required for the procedure and or the nature of the contact. This will be discussed later. Masks should fully cover the nose and mouth and prevent fluid penetration. Masks should fit snugly over the nose and mouth. For this reason, masks that have a flexible nose piece and can be secured to the head with string ties or elastic are preferable. Goggles provide barrier protection for the eyes. 
personal prescription lenses do not provide optimal eye protection and should not be used as a substitute for goggles. Goggles should fit snugly over and around the eyes or personal prescription lenses. Goggles with anti-fog features will help maintain the clarity of vision. When skin protection, in addition to mouth, nose, and eye protection, is needed or desired, for example, when spray or splash is anticipated or possible, a face shield can be used as a substitute to wearing a mask or goggles. The face shield should cover the forehead, extend below the chin, and wrap around the side of the face. PPE also is used to protect you from hazardous or infectious aerosols, such as microbacterium tuberculosis. Respirators that filter the air before it is inhaled should be used for respiratory protection. The most commonly used respirators in our setting are the N95, N99, or N100 particulate respirators. The device has a submicron filter capable of excluding particles that are less than 5 microns in diameter. Respirators are approved by the CDC's National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Like other PPE, the selection of a respirator type must consider the nature of the exposure and risk involved. For example, N95 particulate respirators might be worn by personnel entering the room of someone with infectious tuberculosis. However, if the affected area is exposed or manipulated during a procedure, or prolonged exposure is necessary, you should wear a higher level of respiratory protection, such as a powered air purifying respirator. Prior to using a respirator, your employer is required to have you medically evaluated to determine that it is safe for you to wear a respirator, to fit test you for the appropriate respirator size and type, and to train you on how and when to use a respirator. You are responsible for fit checking your respirator before use to make sure it has a proper seal. There are four key points to remember about PPE use. First, don it before you have any contact, generally before entering the room. Once you have PP on, use it carefully to prevent spreading contamination. Once you have completed your tasks, remove the PPE carefully and discard it in the receptacles provided. Then immediately perform hand hygiene before touching anything or performing other tasks. The gown should be donned first. The mask or respirator should be put on next and properly adjusted to fit. Remember to fit check the respirator. The goggles or face shield should be donned next and the gloves are donned last. Keep in mind, the combination of PPE used and therefore the sequence for donning will be determined by the precautions that need to be taken. To don a gown, first select the appropriate type for the task and the right size for you. The opening of the gown should be in the back. Secure the gown at the neck and waist. If the gown is too small to fully cover your torso, use two gowns. Put on the first gown with the opening in the front and the second gown over the first with the opening in the back. Some masks are fastened with ties, others with elastic. If the mask has ties, place the mask over your mouth, nose, and chin. Fit the flexible nose piece to the form of your nose bridge. Tie the upper set at the back of your head and the lower set at the base of your neck. If a mask has elastic headbands, separate the two bands, hold the mask in one hand and the bands in the other. Place and hold the mask over your nose, mouth, and chin. Then stretch the bands over your head and secure them comfortably as shown. One band on the upper back of your head, the other below the ears at the base of the neck. Adjust the mask to fit. Remember, you don't want to be touching it during the use. So take the few seconds needed to make sure it is secure on your head and fit snugly around your face so that there is no gaps. The technique for donning a particulate respirator, such as an N95, N99, or N100, is similar to putting on a preformed mask with elastic headbands. Key differences, however, are, one, the need to first select a respirator for which you have been fit tested, and two, fit checking the device. As you have been instructed before, 
entering an area where there may be an airborne infectious disease, be sure to follow the manufacturer's instructions for donning the device. In some instances, the manufacturer's instructions may differ slightly from this presentation. You may also be asked to wear an elastometric or powered air purifying respirator. Guidance on how to use these devices is not included in this presentation. You will need instruction locally to properly use these devices. If eye protection is needed, either goggles or a face shield should be worn. Position either device over the face and or eyes and secure the head using the attached earpieces or headband. Adjust to fit comfortably. Goggles should feel snug, but not tight. The last item of PPE donned is a pair of gloves. Be sure to select the type of glove needed for the task in the size that best fits you. Insert each hand into the appropriate glove and adjust as needed for the comfort and dexterity. If you're wearing an isolation gown, tuck the gown cuff securely under each glove. This provides a continuous barrier, protection for your skin. In addition to wearing PPE, you should also use safe work practices. Avoid contaminating yourself by keeping your hands away from your face and not touching or adjusting PPE. Also, remove your gloves if they become torn and perform hand hygiene before putting on a new pair of gloves. You should also avoid spreading contamination by limiting surfaces and items touched with contaminated gloves. To remove PPE safely, you must first be able to identify what sites are considered clean and what are contaminated. In general, the outside front and sleeves of the isolation gown and outside front of the goggles, mask, respirator, and face shield are considered contaminated, regardless of whether there is visible soil. Also, the outside of the gloves are contaminated as well. The areas that are considered clean are the parts that will be touched when removing PPE. These include inside of the gloves, inside and back of the gown, including the ties, and the ties, elastic, or earpieces of the mask, goggles, and face shield. The sequence for removing PEP is intended to limit opportunities for self-contamination. The gloves are considered the most contaminated pieces of PPE and are therefore removed first. The face shield or goggles are next because they are more cumbersome and would interfere with removal of other PPE. The gown is third in the sequence, followed by the mask or respirator. The location for removing PPE will depend on the amount and type of PPE worn and a category of isolation being practiced, if applicable. If only gloves are worn as PPE, it is safe to remove and discard them in the room. When a gown or full PPE is worn, PPE should be removed at the doorway or in an anteroom. Respirators should always be removed outside the room after the door is closed. Hand hygiene should be performed after all PPE is removed. To remove gloves, using one gloved hand, grasp the outside of the opposite glove near the wrist, pull, and peel the glove away from the hand. The glove should now be turned inside out with the contaminated side now on the inside. Hold the removed glove in the opposite gloved hand. Slide one or two fingers of the ungloved hand under the wrist of the remaining glove. Peel the glove off from the inside, creating a bag for both gloves. At this point, no visible blood should be present on the outside of the glove. If that is true, the gloves may be disposed of in any waste container that won't pose a hazard to the general public. If visible blood or other bodily fluids are present on the new outside of the glove, then a hazardous material bin should be used. Next, remove your goggles or face shield by grasping only the ear or head pieces with your ungloved hands. Lift away from your face, and you may dispose of them at this point in the designated receptacle for disposal or cleaning and reuse. Next, to remove your isolation gown, unfasten the gown ties with your ungloved hands. Slip hands underneath the gown at the neck and shoulder. Peel away from the shoulders. Slip the fingers of one hand 
under the cuff of the opposite arm. Pull the hand into the sleeve, grasping the gown from the inside. Reach across and pull the sleeve off the opposite arm. Fold the gown towards the inside and fold or roll into a bundle. Only the clean part of the gown should be visible. Discard into a waste container for disposal or linen container for laundering and reuse as appropriate. When removing a mask, the front of the mask is considered contaminated and should not be touched. Remove by handling only the ties or elastic bands starting with the bottom then the top tie or band. Lift the mask or respirator away from the face and discard into the designated waste receptacle. When removing a particular respirator, the bottom elastic should be lifted over the head first, then remove the top elastic. This should be done slowly to prevent the respirator from snapping off the face. Hand hygiene is the cornerstone of preventing infection transmission. You should perform hand hygiene immediately after removing PPE. If your hands become visibly contaminated during PPE removal, wash hands before continuing to remove PPE. Wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water, or if hands are not visibly contaminated, then you may use an alcohol-based hand rub. Standard precautions is an outgrowth of universal precautions. Universal precautions was first recommended in 1987 to prevent the transmission of bloodborne pathogens to healthcare personnel. In 1996, the application of the concept was expanded and renamed standard precautions. Standard precautions is intended to prevent the transmission of common infectious agents to healthcare personnel, patients, and visitors in any healthcare setting. During care for any patient, one should assume that an infectious agent could be present in the patient's blood or bodily fluids, including all secretions and excretions except tears and sweat. Therefore, appropriate precautions, including use of PPE, must be taken. Whether PPE is needed and, if so, which type is determined by the type of clinical interaction with the patient and the degree of blood and bodily fluid contact that can be reasonably anticipated and by whether the patient has been placed on isolation precautions such as contact or droplet precautions or airborne infection isolation. Under standard precautions, gloves should be used when touching blood, bodily fluids, secretions, excretions, or contaminated items and for touching mucous membranes and non-intact skin. A gown should be used during procedures and patient care activities when contact of clothing and or exposed skin with blood, bodily fluids, secretions, or excretions is anticipated. Aprons are sometimes used as PPE over scrubs. Masks and goggles or a face shield should be used during patient care activities that are likely to generate splash flashes and sprays of blood, bodily fluids, secretions, or excretions. In some instances, healthcare personnel are required to wear PPE in addition to that recommended for standard precautions. The three expanded precaution categories, formerly called transmission-based precautions, where this applies are contact and droplet precautions and airborne infection isolation. When removing a patient from a healthcare setting, Paying attention to signage on their room is important in determining the level of protection necessary for personnel and should be relayed. Contact precautions require gloves and gown for contact with the patient and or the environment of care. In some instances, use of this PPE is recommended for even entering the patient's environment. Droplet precautions require the use of a surgical mask. An airborne infection isolation requires that only a respirator be worn in place of a mask. Hand hygiene has been mentioned several times during this presentation. Hand hygiene is an essential infection control practice to protect you and everyone you interact with professionally and personally, and is required for both standard and expanded precautions. Hand hygiene should be performed immediately after removing PPE, even during PPE changes and removal if necessary. 
and between contacts with potentially infected people. Wash your hands thoroughly with soap and warm water, or if hands are not visibly soiled, use an alcohol-based hand rub. It is important to clean regularly to ensure that infectious agents do not have time to build up. What type of surface do you think collects debris and infectious agents the quickest? If you set a horizontal surface, you are correct. As agents float through the air, they are more likely to settle on a horizontal surface as they land. So counters, tables, chairs, and equipment with a horizontal surface should be cleaned or at least wiped down with sanitizer between every procedure. If you keep a small bucket with diluted sanitizer on the counter, a cloth can be kept in the sanitizer to wipe down surfaces that look clean to the naked eye or contain minor debris. If surfaces look relatively clean between procedures, the sanitizer will remain visibly clean and only has to be changed out at the end of each day. If you have a case that causes splatter on these surfaces or if you are cleaning a surface that is always visibly soiled, such as a prep table, use disposable towels or use a professional laundering service that is equipped for healthcare grade soiled linen and can handle the biohazardous contaminants present. It is important when using mops that the solution be changed at least daily, and that the mop be given time between days for the mop head to completely dry, killing any microorganisms present. Single-use or disposable mop heads are also a great investment if the floor is completely soiled or if the time does not allow for proper drying. Vertical surfaces should be cleaned at least monthly, but preferably weekly or less. These surfaces include cabinets, walls, blinds, windows, and doors. If splatter occurs, typically something that is common on the wall or the floor. This, of course, should be cleaned up immediately after the procedure. There should never be any cloth furnishings in any room where bloodborne pathogens or other infectious agents are present. They bury into the cloth and getting them out is not easy, or sometimes possible. As a result, they pose a significant risk of transmission. This includes blinds, chairs, carpeting, and wallpaper. Medical waste programs include both hazardous products as well as sharps. Medical waste is to be disposed of by a properly licensed and equipped company that specializes in this type of disposal. Medical waste is typically disposed of through incineration or autoclaving prior to transit to the landfill. It is important that employees that handle medical waste are properly trained to do so and use appropriate handling and disposal methods. Color-coded bags are universally used in the United States to identify a bag's contents. Red bags or bins indicate anatomical waste, such as products containing bodily fluid or cells. This includes organs, blood, and medical devices containing either. Orange bags are for clinical waste with a standard level of hazard or lack of a hazard. Yellow bags are for highly infectious agent. Black is for municipal waste, and a combination of yellow and black indicates offensive but not hazardous waste. Blue is traditionally labeled as medicinal non-hazardous and is also commonly used for linen by professional medical linen services. Sharps should be kept in an appropriate sharps container. The container should be properly secured and taped to ensure it does not reopen. Then place the container into the cardboard box with the biohazard bag. The sharps container should not be placed inside of the biohazard bag to provide easy access to it at the waste company if needed. The box should then be marked accordingly by checking off the box that indicates that a sharps container is packaged within. If the municipal sewage system or your septic tank are deemed by the health department as sufficient to dispose of medical fluids, then carefully pour blood or other bodily fluids into the toilet or other appropriate disposal sink. If this is not warranted by the health department or the appropriate government body overseeing the sewage system, a product is available to solidify bodily fluids, allowing them to be disposed disposed of in the biohazard box serviced by your local medical waste company. Please let your colleagues know about this course and visit all of the links below this video that give you industry-specific protection information.